Part 3, Teacher Appreciation Week. So we're rolling into Teacher Appreciation Week, which for some people is a big deal and for some people isn't. I think this probably varies a lot by the grade levels that we teach and geographically where you are and what the what the economic situation in your community is. For me, I, I work in one of the wealthiest counties in the country. And so depending on the school that you're at within the county, sometimes this can be a very serious week and you can get some really cool stuff. I have some friends who teach elementary school and in the past they have received excellent seats to uh, professional baseball and football games. I mean, we're talking sitting behind home plate kind of deal. I know someone who was given an Xbox, someone who's given a flat screen TV. I know someone who was given um, a gift card to a local restaurant where it was essentially a dinner out for him and his wife for, I think it was like once a month for the rest of the year was the equivalent monetarily. Most people, you know, Again, we're elementary school teachers where you only really have to buy for one teacher. As a high school teacher, you normally don't see anything quite like that because the kid has seven or eight teachers and it's hard to keep track. And by that point, the parents sort of lose focus on this, at least sometimes. Monetary gifts are great. And so, you know, please, if you are interested in sending money, gift cards, whatever else, please do. I'm not discouraging it. But I would also tell you that sometimes the nicest thing that you can get for a Teacher Appreciation Week is just a little recognition and a thank you. So for those of you who see how hard that your children's teachers are working, you're reading the emails, you're seeing all the time that's going into this. If you can imagine how hard that person was already working in ways that you didn't see before everybody had to stay at home, then this is a kind of a different teacher appreciation week and maybe one that we should do something a little extra or a little special for. My advice, write a letter, write an email. Be specific, talk to that teacher, say what you appreciate about what that person's done. Now, if the teacher's terrible, don't write him a letter. That's fine. You know, let's be honest. Some people just don't need to be appreciated. But if you feel good about what your what your students, teachers are doing this year, maybe more than any other, it would be great to get an email, to send a card, maybe even deliver an email or a note to the principal so that person understands how much you value and appreciate what the school faculty is doing. Something else that that can be done with this, uh, with the, the letter, the note, the card, whatever, would be to have the student write it himself or herself. I'm sure I'm not the only teacher who does this, but when I receive cards and notes from students or when I get a really nice email, I save all of it. I save all of it and it's rare that I go back and look, but sometimes I'm having a bad day and I just, I pull out the, I pull out the folders and I go, well, what do I got here? When I go back and look at nice things that people have said in the past, it cheers me up, makes me feel a little bit better. That's actually a strategy I use to get through days where I have very bad, uh, say, parent meetings. You sit in an IEP meeting or something, it gets contentious. You know, anytime for me as a teacher, I walk out of a, a, a situation like that thinking, why am I doing this? I can make more money doing something else. This is stupid. What am I doing? Sometimes I, I open the drawer in my filing cabinet. I pull out a couple of notes or letters, or I open the folder on my computer, and I look at past emails that I've saved. And it it does make you feel a lot better. So while we can't always compensate teachers monetarily for their work, though that is an important issue, it's one I just talked about in the previous section of this episode, but since that's not something that we can always do, especially right now when a lot of families are dealing with uncertainty, people are out of work, people are furloughed, um, you know, we just don't know what's going to happen. And so this year, maybe more than previous years, it might be hard to give that gift, I think this is the best year to write the letter, to write the note. Say thank you to the people who matter. So I'm going to take a quick minute. I'm going to roll through just a couple of teachers. I'm going to do this off the top of my head. I did not prepare a list or notes for this. So if I have any of my previous teachers listening and I don't name you, please don't take it personally. And if you would like personal thanks, you are welcome to contact me and I will say something nice about you, uh, (laughs) whether you deserve it or not. No, (laughs) Um, I have myself, you know, I appreciate my teachers because I've learned a lot from them. And I think that sometimes the most important things I learned was not the content. I've talked about this before and I'll say it again now, but I really think the most important things that we learn in school are through extracurriculars, in the hallways, the cafeterias, the school buses. They're the conversations in class. It's not always the class content itself. I'm not saying content isn't important. I'm just saying that, you know, the average person forgets almost everything they learned in high school within the first 10 years after high school. Like, talk to a 30-year-old and have them take the state standardized tests that they passed when they were 15, and almost none of them are going to pass them at that point, right? The content was not actually the most important thing. So, 
sometimes what we learn is about how to learn or how to treat people. We learn about ourselves. And I think that that's really important. So for me, starting in elementary school, my kindergarten teacher was Mrs. Ingram. And she was also the principal of the school. It's a very small elementary school. She was one of the kindest and most focused people I've ever, ever met. She has since passed away. It was tragic. And But I know that she was very important for me because I was a smart kid who was occasionally bullied. I also got into a lot of fights because I did not tolerate being bullied. And I, I don't I can't imagine a person being more understanding or supportive through those circumstances. And so that was that was an important start to my school career. First grade, second grade were great. My third grade teacher, who oddly enough has also passed away, uh, she was probably the youngest of my elementary school teachers, Mrs. Smith. She was fantastic. Uh, She was just the nicest person, focused, energetic. Uh, I'll never forget that it was the first time I heard my mom really excited after a back to school night. She was so happy to have met my third grade teacher. And I, I just, I've always remembered that. I don't actually remember a lot about the class. I just remember how much she cared. And that was an important thing. My fourth grade teacher, her name was Mrs. Horanic. Um, and you know, last name is now different. She was a teacher who she, I mean, eccentric would be the right word. What's interesting now, and I I'll, I'll tread carefully here because this is one of my teachers who might actually be listening to this. When I was in her class, I liked her, but did not like that class. And she has a very funny story. Maybe I'll interview her sometime because she was a teacher and then a counselor. I think she then served on a school board. She's done a lot in education, Um, but she has a funny story about how she assigned a, a packet of research work to do. And apparently, I don't remember this, but I went and told her that I don't have time for this, that I thought it was unfair uh, that she would ask us to do so much work at home because I had, I don't remember, baseball practice or football practice or something. And and it's hilarious that she's she's told me this since. She's now actually one of my former teachers that I keep in contact with the most. She sends gifts for my children on their birthdays and Christmas. And, and oddly enough, though, I didn't really love the class, you know, when I was in it in fourth grade, I think back and I think she was doing things that were probably kind of cutting edge in a way. I think she's also probably walking a fine line on what was allowed and what was appropriate. But we did a a lunch date activity where she would pair up a boy and a girl from class. And instead of going to the cafeteria, you would stay in her classroom. And she did like a candlelit dinner and she'd teach you all about manners and etiquette and how to dance and do all this stuff. It was super awkward, you know, when you're, I don't know what, eight, eight years old, nine years old. Everyone dreaded it, and you know you, you always worried about who you're going to be paired with and everything else. I, I, you know we can argue about the format of the thing, but in the end, she was essentially teaching the kinds of soft skills and the interpersonal skills that we really do use later in life. I've probably used the things I learned during that very very awkward half hour of lunch. I've probably used that more in my life than a lot of the actual content that came out of other classes. She also did a lot of research work where you'd get a packet of what we would now call guided notes or skeleton notes, and you'd have to either you know use the internet, which most people at that point didn't have, or you had to go to the library, get some encyclopedias, and you'd fill them out. It, was, it took forever. It was awful. But you know what? I, my parents were supportive. I spent hours at the library with my mom. We got, we got frustrated together. I learned so much about how to research. I learned so much about how to not give up. Those were really important experiences. I I might think differently about it now if my parents had not been involved and my mom had not been such a big help through it. But uh, my fourth grade teacher, Ms. Hubble White, you know, she was Ms. Ceranic then. She was fantastic. My fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Cromer, was probably one of the most important people to me in elementary school, just because I think a lot of people thought of her as being a very mean and strict person. She, I don't even know. I, my, my, my dad always said she kind of looked like the Wicked Witch, and I always thought that was mean because that I don't think that's what she looked like, but he said that. Um, but everyone said she was the toughest teacher in the building. She was the fifth grade teacher. She was tall. She was strict. She was stern. And what I realized after I was there was this was the point at which um, I had sort of an ongoing rivalry with another student, and she was the most caring and intuitive person. She always sort of saw when the problems were there. She helped me to understand why they were there. She helped me to understand how to overcome problems with other students. And she was actually one of the first people who told me in a way that that I was different from the other students and that that was a good thing and that I couldn't let anyone get to me. And I think that's probably true of everyone. And, you know, so I'm not saying that I'm actually special in that capacity, but the fact that the woman who had the reputation for being the meanest, toughest, strictest person in the building turned out to actually maybe be the most caring and the most observant was really impressive to me. And, and that was a person who had a massive impact on my life. I think back through middle school and we had a, you know, you always have a lot of 
good teachers, and I, I'm probably skipping a few that were really great, but you know, Mr. Marsh was a sixth grade social studies teacher, and he made us memorize every what was it? Every province and capital in Canada, every state and capital in the United States, and every country and capital in Central and South America. And you had to stand up in front of the room and recite it. And he had a song, but it wasn't even a song. It didn't even rhyme. And I remember having to do it. And in retrospect, I mean, I actually do know a lot of that still, oddly enough, but the confidence or at least the, the, the overcoming the terror of getting up and doing it was one of the most important experiences I probably had in sixth grade. And so that was a big one. I had a few English teachers, Ms. Kaufman in eighth grade, who was really good. She, she did an independent reading project and everybody was picking books about, you know, ponies and football and whatever. And I picked the pick your own adventure or something. And she pulled me aside and said that I, I could probably do something a little bit different. And I didn't know what that meant. She said, you know, you, you shouldn't be reading about football right now. I know you like it, but you can do better than that. And I was like, I, I was kind of offended. And then she handed me Julius Caesar. And so I had my first run in with Shakespeare in eighth grade and it was Julius Caesar. Um, you know, I didn't fully get all of it or appreciate all of it, but it was the first time that I saw that I had abilities with reading and writing and speaking that maybe not everyone else did. And so that obviously had a big impact on me. She was kind of a, a mean teacher in a lot of other ways. I mean, she was fun sometimes, but that was an important moment that sort of pulled aside. I was also involved in the gifted program. And so Mrs. Lacey, who is our middle school gifted teacher, was fantastic. We did a million field trips. We did a million hands-on activities. That's something that I'm actually interested in doing in the future, possibly. Um, so Mrs. Lacey was very important. High school is tough because I had a lot of good teachers in high school. Again, what's interesting, I think, is that sometimes the most important things I learned in high school weren't the content. The most important person in my high school career, the person who I probably appreciate the most, and I had a, I had a lot of good ones, was probably Mr. Johnson, who was a business teacher, and he ran the production team for our spring musical. And what's funny is that um, I did take a couple of, you know, Microsoft Office suite classes and basic, you know, computer business classes or whatever with him. But working with him on the musical production crew, we did the we raised the money, did the programs and the ticketing. I learned more working on that musical, on the business side of that musical, than probably anything anything else I learned in high school. I contacted local businesses. I learned how to make cold calls. I learned how to create databases. I learned how to sell. We did uh, layouts and all sorts of media design. We had to make the program, do the ticketing, all of it. We also had to balance the budget and make sure we had enough money for the shows. And so you're like, oh, yeah, whatever, High School Musical. My junior year, we put on The Wizard of Oz. And it was always his dream to do it. And so we did a, uh, we brought in a professional pyrotechnics crew. We had professional flight crew for flying monkeys and the flying wicked witch had every year we did Saturday night. There was a dinner theater for my junior year. We did a four show run of the wizard of Oz at my high school auditorium. And we had a budget of just over $40,000 and a team of about uh, 10 or 12 of us raised $40,000 from local businesses to put on that show. I learned so much from Mr. Johnson, even though the man was completely insane, completely insane, neurotic. I, someday I'll do an episode where I'll just tell funny stories about him. But that's a guy I really appreciate. I actually feel bad about because I, I think I only spoke to him maybe one time after high school. But that's a guy who had a massive influence on my ability to communicate well with other people, to make plans, to execute bigger projects and things like that. Another one, Mr. Runkle, was my AP, or not AP bio, advanced bio, it was human anatomy class. That was actually my first run in with what we now might consider sort of a blended learning, though it was not super technical. You know, it was it was very low tech, but we we learned every bone in the human body and almost every one of the muscles and a handful of the nerves. We dissected a fetal pig, uh, an I think it was a sheep's eyeball, a sheep's heart, a sheep's brain. There's something else in there I'm missing. And then there was a human model. And so class was basically, you know, hands-on hands on labs and dissections and labeling. And then there was a, a big quiz or a big test, I think, every week, every two weeks. We formed study groups. I had more fun hanging out with my friends for advanced bio study groups than a lot of other things I did in high school that probably sound like they were more fun. Uh, you know, Mr. Runkle was was really funny and he was he was a cool guy. He really knew his stuff, but he was tough. And that's that's a place where I really learned how important high expectations are. It's also one of the reasons that I really do believe that uh, knowledge has power and that we don't just need to, you know, teach kids just the skills kind of thing. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, don't don't bother teaching them anything that they can Google. Let's be honest, you can Google anything. And I know an awful lot from that class still. 
I also know how to how to learn, how to study, how to remember, and I learned how to manage my time. And um, so, you know, while the human body learning was great, and it's actually bio and English were always my two favorite classes. Uh, a lot of my teaching, I think, especially my higher level classes, goes back to a few of these people, and and one of them would have been Mr. Runkle because I do think it's important to make it hard. You know, you can you can always increase a kid's grade. But if you make it too easy, you, you can't lower it. No kid's ever going to let you lower their grade. But if, if I give a test and everyone gets a C or a D, I can curve it up, but you can never curve it back down. And so Mr. Runkle was a guy who who set those high expectations and, and watched people rise to it and then adjusted as necessary. And I, I think that was really important. Another important uh, high school teacher was my gift teacher, Mr. Murray, who I think at certain points I liked a lot. At certain points, I thought he was kind of old and weird. I should say this nicely because I'm friends with him online, too. Uh, <laughs> but I learned I learned a lot there because we had the opportunity to take the gifted class as either a major where you did an independent project and a class, or you could do them, you know, one or the other. And I dabbled in both the class, then the project and, and taking the class as a quote unquote major. I learned a ton. I learned, I mean, you name it. We did engineering competitions. We I did something on like ethanol fuel in the 19, I don't know, it was late 1990s. We did the project as that was just becoming something that was actually happening and people were talking about. We did mock trials. I learned parliamentary procedure. We did a, we ran class for, I think, a whole month. Class was a student run using parliamentary procedure. Students traded off on rolls. He also assigned a lot of very high-level classic lit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and be honest here. One of the most important things that I learned for survival uh, was how to not read a book and make it look like I did. As a person who went on to be an English major, that was really important. Now, you know, I did read most of the stuff, but... Um, yeah, in in that gifted class, I remember I think he assigned, I think it was Charles Dickens' Bleak House when I was in 10th grade. Um, yeah, not happening. If any of you have ever read it, you know, more power to you. But we had to we had to figure out some ways to get through some of these things. And so while I did read some of the books, I also learned how to read parts of things and make it seem like I'd done the whole thing. And that probably sounds terrible, but that is a valuable skill, uh, knowing how to sort of identify key information, things like that. But a lot of the projects and again, a lot of field trips there were very, very important in who I am, both as a person and as a teacher. You know, and I could do I could do a few more because there's a bunch. My AP Bio teacher was fantastic. I had uh, I had a couple of good math teachers um, who I actually you know may or may not have gotten along with, but um, I, I really did have a, a good run. The the one I'm going to end with is actually not a person who was necessarily my best teacher, though she was one of my best liked teachers. Uh, but she is a person who probably is one of the biggest reasons I ended up being a teacher, even though that's not something I ever intended to do. It was Randy Ashenfelder was my English teacher in ninth grade. And then again, in 11th grade for AP Lang, which is a class that I now teach. And I remember in ninth grade, you know, we did a bunch of funny stuff and she was very cool. She was a cool lady, you know, very fun, funny, you know, cool, short hair. She was, I don't know. She was just, she was kind of quirky and, and very, very cool. And probably, probably an old hippie. I don't know. But in 11th grade for AP Lang, I remember that that was a point where I learned that sometimes you had to speak up when things didn't seem right. And while she didn't even always respond well to it, I realized that teachers, it's a point where I realized like teachers are people too. And so as a student, the best thing to do is to talk to your teacher with a lot of respect, but to remember that they're people and remember that they can make mistakes. And she was very good about, you know, mostly not making them, but when she did, she usually did a good job of covering uh, and then as a funny sort of side story, she, you know, a lot of times class, she was finishing her previous class and the bell would ring and we'd be ready to go. And she was still at her desk, you know, finishing up or organizing papers or something. And so it became a running joke that in my AP line class, my junior year of high school, I would go to the podium and begin taking role. And that would be her cue to like, Hey, get it together. Get up here. We got stuff to do. Um, and so every day I would, I would read through it and take attendance for her. It started off just messing with her. And then it just ended up being, I had to do it because she was going to sit at her desk for a little bit. And I would do the Ferris Bueller thing. You know, I'd get partway through the list There's Bueller, Bueller. And so I always knew from that point on, um, you know, that, that you could be funny and still run a class. But when I made a particularly good comment or a particularly smart ass comment in class, she would call me Ferris. Uh, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off is one of my favorite movies. And she, uh, but she would do that, you know, she would call me Ferris. And I always thought that, that was kind of funny. And thinking back on it, what I learned from her about being a person and being a teacher 
And then there's little moments where I stood up and either took attendance or, you know, at the end of class, she'd be like, we're done. And there was five minutes left. And I would just start mouthing off and pretending like I was teaching the class. That was actually kind of a big deal. Uh, I didn't want to be a teacher. I was most of the way through college before I even really honestly considered the option. But I think experiences in Ms. Ashenfelder's room created the foundation that helped me later on to seriously consider and ultimately become an English teacher. So she had a big impact on me, and I appreciate that as well. From college, the list is is long. James Madison University is a very good school, and I had some excellent professors there. But probably the two who had the biggest impact on me were a, an anthropology professor named, I believe her name was Andrea Wiley. And I, I took, she was tough. It was, they were always like the hardest classes. And I did everything I could to convince my friends to take the classes, you know, with me, just because I wanted to have friends in there. But we did human evolutionary psychology. There was an evolutionary biology class. There was a, a global demographics class. I, I Once I'd had one class with her, I took as many as I could. She was very smart. She was very focused. She was witty, but she never really wasted time. She got to know the students, but almost never engaged in too much casual chatting during class, but you could always talk to her afterwards. Uh, again, it was sort of like that advanced bio class in high school. Very high expectations, and I, I do think that that's very important and it's something I respected about her. I learned a ton about anthropology, and that's that's one of the reasons that I stayed interested in the field was that I had a teacher, I had a professor who really knew what she was doing, and she was serious about it, and I loved it. And so anthropology is still something I'm very passionate about, and a lot of that has to do with, with what I learned from her. Probably the most important person in terms of yeah, – probably the most important person in my college career, certainly my most important professor – it was Dr. Mark Facknitz. And again, I don't know if he listens, but I have to be nice here because you were friends on Facebook. But even if he wasn't, I would never say anything bad. I, I used to say, I, my teaching style has probably changed a little bit, but for the first 10 years of my teaching career, I used to say that on my best days, I was just trying to do a Mark Facknitz impression. Uh, he was one of the smartest people I've ever met. The man holds, uh, I believe, two doctorates in, I think it's French and English or, you know, English literature or, you know, literature. He was intuitive. He understood what students were facing. He understood how to get the best out of his students. That was another person who I, I went out of my way to take classes with him, even though I knew they were going to be hard and I, I wasn't going to be guaranteed a high grade. I just felt like it was more important to learn. And, and I really do think he was the best English professor in that university. Not that I had them all. There were probably other, other very good ones. And I had some other very good English professors as well. But Mark Facknitz is the guy who really sold me on the idea that literature is important, not just because it's entertaining, but because stories are how people come to understand their world. So if you want to understand your world, you need stories. And if you want other people to understand your world, you need to share stories with them. And I still use a lot of the knowledge and skills that I gained from him um, in my classes today. And so, you know, for Teacher Appreciation Week, I think the most important thing that we can all do is go ahead and thank the people who have who have helped us or who are currently helping us. And to say it specifically and to say it honestly, if it's easier at this point, since we're not in school, put it in writing and send it to them. But I think that we should always appreciate the people who make contributions in our lives. And some of those people I've, I've reached out to in the past and some of them I haven't, but I figure I'm, I'm here talking anyway, so I might as well go ahead and call out a few names. There are a lot of other good teachers and professors I had. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I keep looking down like I have notes and I don't, I guarantee I'm missing a few people who are very important along the way as well. And I feel bad that I'm missing them, but you should appreciate the people who work hard on your behalf, even if you don't always love them or you don't always use what they did for you. Uh, if someone else puts in time and effort to make your life better or to help you, that's a thing that you should always appreciate. And you should never take for granted. And maybe that's something that more people are recognizing now that we're home from school. But that doesn't mean that it's something that should stop when we return. Be grateful for the people in your life who are trying to help you. And when you see that and you understand the impact that they're having, you want to make sure that you say thank you. 